Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. Our guest today, Arlene Battisil, she's the best-selling author of the book Retail Shock Therapy, a prescription for what ails your online sales. She's a Shark Tank TV star. You've probably seen her on Shark Tank. She's a co-founder of GoGo Gear, and Damon John calls Retail Shock Therapy a must-read for businesses selling online. It's available on Amazon. Arlene, welcome to the program today. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. You've got a very cool story. I, I uh, saw your episode <laughs> in Shark Tank. And I know that shark. I know that your your career and your journey is way before and way after Shark Tank, but it's a yeah, starting yeah. point where many of many of us got a chance to see you on a bigger stage. And so, <laughs> uh, why don't you start at the beginning for me? Kind of tell us a little bit about your personal journey that got you to where you are today, and just some of the highlights that you want to share. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I I think for the purpose of your um, audience, what is most relevant is, you know, the point at which you're going about business in life and then something completely disrupts that and oftentimes it's something that happens that is completely outside of your control. It could be uh, an illness, it could be a death in the family, it could be um, any number of things and in my case it was a job loss and I had been uh, working in the real estate development field for many, many years uh, here in Southern California, and I was a project manager for um, pretty much master planned residential communities. And um, the last project that I had been managing was a $300 million um, new housing development uh, north of Los Angeles. Mm. And in um, the middle of 2008, uh, I saw our company's financials and I thought, I'm not going to be here by the end of this year. I could tell. I knew it already. And wow. sure enough, by December, um, I uh, <laughs> was notified that they were taking my job away because <laughs> I actually am working on another book right now that's called I Didn't Lose My Job, They Took It. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what happened to me. Wow. I, didn't, okay. I didn't lose it. I know exactly where it is. <laughs> and they won't give it back. <laughs> So I figured I'm just going to write a book with that title. I mean, it doesn't even need to say anything inside. It just needs that title because that's, there's so many of us who can relate to the experience yeah, of their jobs. Yeah, that's a great title. And so at the end of 2008, um, as you and everyone else well knows, uh, you know, the real estate market just imploded. And it was catastrophic here in California because it's such a big market. And mm. I knew at that point, given the level I was at in the company, I was one, one level of management below the executive level. I knew that I was never going to see that job again. Uh, that job was gone forever. Uh, and that remains the case here eight years later, okay. that that level of uh, management um, uh, was never going to find its way back because it was easier to just outsource all of that level of management to, to those of us who were no longer employed. <laughs> we would right. come back cons as consultants, and that works great for the company, but it provides nothing to those of us who had our jobs taken away. So right. there we are at the end of 2008, and it just so happens that um, I, I ride a motorcycle and I ride a scooter, and I was commuting on my bike, and I couldn't wear, I, I would wear a suit, and the only thing I had to deal with was that I had a helmet on, and my hair was messy, and so I kept my hair short so that I could at least take my helmet off, look in my little mirrors, and do something to my hair before <laughs> I walked into my office. And I'd leave my helmet on my bike, so never, no one ever knew that I was coming in on a bike. Hmm. Well, the problem with that is that, um, I wasn't wearing anything protective to ride, and it's really dangerous to do that. It's life-threatening to mm. be riding without any protection. And fortunately, here in California, uh, we have a helmet law, so at least you're protecting what brains you've been given. <laughs> right. Um, and so when I lost my job at the end of 2008, I 
knew that I was not going to be back in the real estate field anytime soon, if ever, because of the, you know, dramatic downturn in the economy and all those jobs going away. And I knew that there there wasn't likely to be another comparable position anywhere for me at that time. And so I decided I'm just going to go do something on my own. And I was lamenting the fact that I couldn't find any protective clothing that I could wear to work over my dress clothing. And that's when, you know, after searching and searching and just giving up, I, especially as a woman who rides, your only options are to wear stuff that's made for guys and it's cut for guys which means it doesn't fit women, and even worse, it doesn't look good on us. Right. And so I spent the next year in 2009, I went into this completely blind. I didn't know anything about fashion. I didn't know anything about sewing. I didn't know anything about anything that had to do with making clothing, and even less making clothing for people who ride motorcycles and scooters. Hmm. And so in that next year, I basically made it up as I went along. Right. I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hopped on a plane and I went to China and I interviewed 17 factories in 22 days and I did not speak a word of Chinese. <laughs> uh, it's amazing what happens back back in 2009 where you know Facebook barely existed and all these other things didn't exist, all these mobile apps didn't exist, but one app that did exist uh, was language translation. And so mm. I made my way through China using my iPhone and my little wow. <laughs> language translator and I got samples made and uh, I was basically reverse engineering a regular garment and turning it into a protective one. So I was building all these safety <laughs> features to the garment and literally I was making it up as I went along and every sample I would get I would try it out as a rider and then go back to the factory and say no I need you to do this and I had no technical experience whatsoever hmm. and it's probably a good thing I didn't know anything because had I I would have never done this <laughs> so, so take me back for just a minute to I mean that's incredible that you went that fast ahead I mean you were in an uncertain place you were laid off or leaving a job and then what made you decide this is the direction I'm going to go I'm going to take this as far as I can or I'm going to take it this far some people have a hobby and they tinker with it a little bit some of us or some entrepreneurs uh, they take an idea and they run with it at lightning speed what was your mindset at that time I think that the biggest issue for me was at that time not only had my job been taken away but the stock market imploded as well hmm. and all of my retirement money you know half of it evaporated literally overnight and at that point I took everything out of the markets out of the mutual fund companies and I, I just put it into money markets because I felt like you know what if if I'm gonna lose my money I want to be the one responsible for losing my money because it's already been demonstrated to me that the markets are going to lose my money and right. the people who managed my money hmm. because everybody lost their money at that time. And I felt like I never wanted to be in a situation again in my life where someone else controlled my financial or economic future. Hmm. And it was from that moment forward that I said, you know what, I may lose everything, but at least it will have been of my own doing and right. no one else's. And that's what motivated the whole thing. And, wow. you know, I spent a, a, an extraordinary amount of money going through the process of creating this product and then this company that I could have avoided had I known what I was doing. But... The, what I know today as a result of that investment in my own learning, it's paid off a hundred times over because I now have a thriving consulting business because mm. of my taking that risk and saying, I'm just going to go do this right. and I'll figure it out as I go along. And what I discovered along the way is by virtue of not knowing a lot of things, especially technical things, I was able to look at situations and just see them from a common sense standpoint where I'd be dealing with technical people and they'd be saying all this crap and I would say, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. And they would right. say, well, that's how it is. And I said, no, that's not how it is. Hmm. That is not how we do this. That's not how this works. You have to figure out another way to do this. Hmm. And then they would start thinking differently because no one has ever pushed people to do anything other than what they know how to do. And this right. happens a lot with technical people. And so you come in, I mean, if, if you have... If you have an entrepreneurial bent, you have any level of management skills, you have 
any problem solving skills, you can pretty much walk into any situation short of trying to put, you know, a plane into the air or send a rocket to the moon. I think you can look at any situation and kind of, you know, suss out exactly what's going on with it and then figure out what needs to be done. And then you get the technical people yeah. that know how to do that stuff. That's great. And so I think just having that approach enabled me to be kind of fearless about this. And the other thing is that I knew I wasn't going to get a job, so what else was I going to do? Right. So I said, I'm just going to do it myself and we'll see what happens. And so what happened is we go into 2010 and now the market has really collapsed. <laughs> and I'm coming to market right at the height of the recession. Wow. One of the things that happened in the industry that I'm in right now with my bike, bike clothing, the power sports industry, is that between 2010 and 2011, there were 18,000 retail stores selling motorcycles and scooters, ATVs, anything that had an engine in it minus the automobile. Hmm. Um, there were 18,000 of those stores in the United States in 2010, and by the end of 2011, there were only 10,000 of them left. Wow. We lost 8,000 <laughs> retail outlets in wow. one year. And what happened when we came to market at the beginning of 2010, the product was now in the country ready for sale. We were going into stores at that point. All of a sudden, as we were gaining momentum and, and beginning to make people throughout the industry and the consumer aware that we were there and this incredibly innovative product was available, all of these stores closed. And what happened with the, the 8,000 stores that closed, all of that inventory that they were holding, they sold it off for pennies on a dollar oh. to the 10,000 stores, which meant none of those stores were buying anything from any of us. And wow. so we were then forced into a situation where we had to start selling direct to the consumer on the internet. And when you're a, when you're a manufacturer and you wholesale your product to stores, it, it's a kiss of death for you because the stores will not buy your product if they think you're competing with them out on the internet. Right. Well, back in, you know, 2010, Amazon was out there, but they were nothing like they are today. Hmm. And the whole retail community, the brick and mortar community, have had to adapt to the fact that, you know, the big giant, Amazon, is going to crush everybody. And if you don't get on board with selling online and being really aggressive about it, you're going to go out of business, which right. has happened in many retail stores. Um, so there we are coming to market at the worst possible time and struggling our way through. We were on Shark Tank. Um, I think we filmed that episode in, um, gosh, I think it was... Uh, August of 2011 and the first airing of that episode was in March of 2012. So what's funny okay. is that, that that episode has been in reruns probably 10 or 15 times now and it's <laughs> international. So <laughs> I always know when the rerun has aired somewhere in the world because we get a flurry of emails from people saying, oh, this is so much fun. <laughs> like, That's yeah, great. That <laughs> they, they're saying, well, how come you don't have the same products anymore? I looked at your website. Nothing's the same. <laughs> that was five <laughs> years ago. <laughs> There's a whole lot that we learned about the consumer in the last five years. Right. And as a business, you have to adapt because mm. if you don't pivot when you see it coming, you're going to be out of business. And right. so we managed to... Um, you know, by the time we got into 2014 and 15, we were really having to hunker down, cutting our costs like crazy, shifting our product mix to those things that were um, less expensive for the consumer. Because what had happened during the recession is that all the big box stores taught the consumer how to buy on a discount as a regular way of life. Right. And we taught everyone to value our products less. And for us, we never dropped the price on our product. We actually had to introduce new products that were half the price of what we were selling. And so by the time we got into 2015, the latter part of 2015, we'd introduced a couple of products in late 2014, and we were finally gaining steam as we got into late 2015. And in February of 2016, we entered Europe, hmm. and our business has exploded. Wow. We got to Europe. We have done more business in the first six months of 2016 than 
multiple years combined <laughs> because we're in Europe. And that's exactly what we were doing when we went on Shark Tank. We were looking to get the money to be able to get our operations set up in Europe. And they, they just kicked our butts to no end about this idea we were going to Europe. But they right. didn't know what we knew, and they weren't patient enough for us to explain why this was so critical. And plus, they aren't bike people. They didn't understand anything. Right. And after that episode aired, what was funny is I had so many people emailing us about them saying, what do the sharks not get about this? Vespas are all over Europe. Right. <laughs> and, you know, the markets there, you know, the combined probably six biggest countries in terms of the number of registered riders over there, it's probably 40 million people <sighs> compared to 7 million in the U.S. And so we had to get into Europe. And so we finally did at the beginning of this year. And it, it has been absolutely stunning, the growth that we've seen in our company. Wow. And so here we are. And then... In the middle of all of this, I built the company and the brand using nothing but social media. Hmm. And this was back in 2009. I was on social media talking about this great new product that, of course, did not yet exist. But I was talking about it like it it was here, it was coming, right. and there was no website, there was no nothing. I just kept talking about <laughs> it. And I built the whole brand uh, using nothing but social media. And as a result, over these past many years, I pretty much taught myself digital marketing before there was a term digital marketing. Hmm. So once I started gaining some success using social media for the purpose of, of outreach to the consumer and selling and actually generating sales, I would tell people what was happening, that how I was doing this, and all of a sudden I had companies and people coming to me in droves um, asking me to show them how I had done what <laughs> I had done. And all of a sudden, I now have this consulting business, which then leads up to <laughs> my, my releasing this book uh, just this past May uh, that's all about everything that I know about selling online and all the ways that people interfere with their ability to sell or, or worse, interfere with the consumer's ability to buy from them. And so I, hmm. I, had, I had worked with so many clients over the years, and I was saying the same thing to them over and over and over again. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to write a freaking book. And then <laughs> if somebody comes to me and wants me to work with them, I send them the book and say, read this first, and then come back and talk to that's, me. That's great. And I want to get into the book more. I have a few other questions for you about your journey. And then I'd love to ask you some very specific questions. One, one thing I noticed and I love is as an entrepreneur, you, you find solutions, you find a way to get it done. You learn as you go. And if there's not something available then or a path available, you create a path. And that's one thing I really like. And another thing is that you are, uh, your business has been adaptable. You're watching the market and you're sensitive to it. And I see so many businesses and we, we do some marketing consulting. We see so many businesses is that refuse and resist change at all costs and they have a product that doesn't change and they have a, a, an audience that doesn't change and they have a platform that doesn't change and, and they're not mobile and, and they're not flexible and I mean what would you say or what advice do you have as far as being able to understand your economy and, and being sensitive to your unique market? I, I think the biggest issue for entrepreneurs and people who are innovators and visionaries is that the biggest trap is falling in love with your own product. We mm. continue to tell ourselves that our product is the latest, greatest, best thing on the market, and we tell ourselves that it's the consumer that's the problem. They right. just don't get it. And what what I always say to people, my clients and other people, and, and whenever I've been you know speaking at in in uh, public events and so forth. Um, is that your job is not to prove that what you're doing works. Your job is to prove that it doesn't. And I'll say that again. Your job is not to prove that your idea works. It is to prove that it doesn't. You have to be hmm. the person that is going to poke the most holes in your idea or your product or in your way of going about doing what you're doing or in your way of doing business because if you can't poke any more holes in it, then you're on to something. Hmm. But what happens with every entrepreneur, uh, and, and this happens a lot in the fashion industry where people have this idea about some new clothing product or some new accessory or whatever, and they're hanging their hats on this one idea, and they feel as if, if, if they are to let go of it, then somehow the whole world has come to an end. And what I always say is, hmm. look, 
you had a great idea to begin with and you were smart because you poked as many holes in it as possible hmm. and you realized that it was going to be deadly to you you were going to bankrupt yourself if you attempted to bring this product to market right. so you are the smart one who says this is not the one to bring to market and you already came up with a great idea. It was clearly a great idea. It just might not work in the market for some reason. Well, you already came up with one great idea. Who's to say you aren't going to have another great idea? Hmm. Why would you think you aren't going to have another great idea? Why, why would you think you aren't going to have another way, another unique way of solving a particular problem for the consumer? Right. And so you have to pivot away from this sort of death grip that you have on your idea or how you approach your business or that you've been doing things the way you've been doing them all along and it's been just fine. Well, yeah, it's been just fine until the economy collapses under the weight of itself and you're laying in ruins right. because you were not paying attention to whether or not the consumer even still needed what it is that you have to offer. Hmm. And one of the things that I talk about in my book is you can have the best idea in the world, but you know what? The consumer is eventually going to find the next greatest product in the world. Be right. The consumer has an incredibly short attention span. So if you're not all over them, out on the internet, on social media, reminding them that you're there. And when your product gets stale, you have to be out there refreshing the consumer's idea of what it is that you're selling, which means you're talking about it in a different way than mm. you've talked about it forever. Wow. So, th th I mean, th this is really what it all comes down to in, in terms of being able to survive. And one of the things that, you know, I, can't, I cannot drive this home um, enough is that you cannot sell based on facts and figures, features and benefits. Nobody buys based on those things. Right. And, then, and then what people will say, yeah, but I have a customer who said, who are asking me, you know, all these technical questions. And I said, well, what about the 99 other customers? <laughs> what did they do? If you're selling them a car, do you, I remember this when I was young, all the advertisements on television were about rack and pinion steering. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what the heck is that? But you know, the right. guy in the advertisement had such an authoritative voice that I thought, oh, that must be important. Okay, I guess I have to ask about that. I have right. no idea what that is. But if somebody walks in to buy a new car, this happens all the time. They don't want to talk to the salesperson because you know what? That person's interfering with the fantasy that they're, that person is walking in the door with, the aspiration that they have about that car. And that car is not about that car. That car is all about how they're going to feel sitting in that car, looking at themselves in that rear view mirror, doing their hair, doing whatever it is, and thinking that everybody thinks they look fine because they're in that car. Right. That they are seeing themselves as the better version of themselves. And that's how people buy. Mm -hmm. Does your product make people feel good? Does it solve the problem for them? Does it answer the burning question of how this product is going to change that person's life? And that's how you have to sell things. Because people buy based on emotion and they use logic to help them justify that purchase. Right. It's so simple and yet <laughs> nobody gets this. Right. I, have more, I have more companies come to me and, and tell me, okay, this is why this is so great, and this is why this is so great. And they get done talking, wear themselves out, tell me all about their product, and then I say, why should I care? <sighs> tell me why I should care about your product, because right now I don't. Right. And I'm a brand new, I'm a, I'm a brand new prospect. Why should I care? And they can't answer the question. And mm. so that's where I have to work with them and say, all right, now we're going to make them care, because we're going to talk to them. The messaging is all about why they care about this. Who cares how much competition you have out there? The only thing we care is that you want to date me and not somebody else. And I'm going to give you a reason to. Right. Great advice. I love that. <laughs> love Nobody it. listens, though. <laughs> <laughs> no. We are listening, I promise. L let me ask you, uh, on, the, on a lighter side, I'd love to ask you about, I was reading an article where we talk about testing your own product, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a big smile on my face reading that, <laughs> looking at you. Uh, I think you... It went down a hill. You were dragged behind a motorcycle, <laughs> and I said, "Wow, that that is really somebody who's going the extra mile to make sure that their product is good for the consumer." And so I made a note that I had to ask you to tell me a little bit about those testing times. Well, this is in the early days when I didn't know any better. <laughs> I was a little younger, so throwing yourself down a hill <laughs> hurt a little less then than it might today. 
But, you know, I thought, okay, how am I going to prove that this product that I've invented actually works? And, and I was so naive that I thought if I just threw myself down a hill, you know, you know I got, I'm all geared up and I, I take a running start and then I throw myself down this hill and I went tumbling down the hill. But, you know, when I posted that, when I posted that video on YouTube, oh, my God, legitimate motorcycle people were just crushing me. <laughs> this is not how you test things. Only, I, you know, I got enough bad comments on that. I got more people looking at it. So from a marketing and advertising standpoint, it did beautifully. It did, it any did the press trick. It's good press, even right. if it's horrible. And so that was my first exercise in understanding, gosh, I really have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> well, I love I it. Just, you went behind it. You had, were dragged behind a motorcycle too as well, right? Yes. I needed to show that I was willing to put myself in harm's way. And yes, I had a guy drag me about 80 feet down the pavement wow. um, in one of the garments that I had made. Because what I felt was really important is that for people who are looking for things to keep them safe, the best way of showing them that it's safe is showing that it works. And mm. so, as has been the case since the beginning, whenever we've had a customer crash in one of our garments, I always ask to get the garment back so I can inspect it and see how it performed because all of that is learning for me in terms of improving the product. And so, you know, I will always do videos and um, post them on uh, the internet and also on Facebook and the rest of the social media demonstrating this is the garment, this is what the customer told me happened to them in this crash. And here I'm showing you the actual garment because it it lends so much um, uh, confidence to the consumer that, yes, I see it. I know that this has happened and I can feel safe in this too. It's one thing to have your friends recommend a product and say, oh, I just love it. It fits great. It looks great and whatever. But when you're talking safety, the best you know recommendation comes from someone who's crashed in it. Right. Yeah, that's more powerful endorsement. Absolutely. So I, I, you're my favorite type of person to learn from because you've gone out there and done it. There's consultants out there you can learn from on so many different variety of topics. Um, I've got an agency. I've, I've got a book on marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. You're the guru. You're the type of people that I want to learn from the most. You've, you've done it very well. So I, I'd love to hear from you more about some of the things you've learned. I mean, you've got this best-selling book, Retail Shock Therapy, talking about online sales. But tell me a little bit more about social media, about digital marketing, and some of the some of the fun things that you've seen work really well, or some of the things that you're excited about that have really gotten great viral value or have been a great tool for you. I think that when you have a product that you're trying to sell online, you know, many people go the route of, okay, I need a Facebook page, I need to get a zillion fans on my Facebook page, I need to be posting 50 billion times a day. And and what happens is that we as business owners will listen to consultants who tell us all the technical part of the exercise, yeah. or they say, this is what we will do for you. But they never talk about the intended outcome, which is to get the consumer to buy. And mm. I find that there are so many consultants who will charge companies all kinds of money to do the act of social media for them right. but you know what's the deliverable what is the true valuable deliverable in what someone is doing and in in my estimation it is the sale are mm -hmm. you delivering sales to me because in digital marketing I can drive traffic all day long anywhere you want me to drive it but if that person is not buying we've got a problem right. and it can be one of two things you're driving the wrong traffic, or it could be a problem with the product. Hmm. And this is something that I talk about in the book, is that p people are so wedded to their product that they never want to accept the fact that maybe the consumer is not interested in their product anymore. Um, and, when, and, and that's in the natural life cycle of a product. You, right. you only have a certain number of years before someone knocks you off <clears throat> or because someone else comes out with a, a, a new and better and improved version of yours or, or the, the consumer taste has changed. Um, right. And so what I always look for out on the Internet, what I'm always looking for is examples of how companies are – either repurposing a product or they're talking about it different than they historically had. Or they come to market with a product with an approach that is so 
crazy that it, it gets the consumer's attention. And I think that one example of that, I think these guys were on Shark Tank. It's the guy that had the product called the Squatty Potty. Yes. And I wrote about this in the book that, I mean, you, I mean, this is this is just a little medical device. It's a little plastic stand to put your feet on when you're when you're going to the bathroom. Right. That's supposed to make it easier for you to go to the bathroom. Okay, fine. You know, old people use these things. Right. Now, how on earth do you make something like that sexy? You can't. It's a medical product. Right. But what they did is they did this outrageously ridiculous video. Where, you know, here's this guy who's dressed up like, you know, a knight in a castle and he's dressed <laughs> in all colorful things. And he's got this multicolored unicorn that is pooping soft serve poop. <laughs> and it goes into the ice cream cone and this guy is licking it. And it's so gross, right. it's so stupid and so funny. <laughs> Yet I think they probably told, sold two million units right. as a result of of that one video and right. they spent a lot of money making that video but believe me they got their money back right. a billion times over right. and so another example I read on the internet at one point was this guy um, you know, okay so going back to language translation this guy had invented a language translator which was just it was probably the design of something that you might see coming from Apple and so it was the design itself that was most compelling because you know we've got language translation apps available and other ways that we do this only the way he was marketing it is he didn't call it a language translation app he said you know how to pick up chicks in other countries right <laughs> and so I just thought that's brilliant because no thought because you're you're you are moving the consumer in the direction of what they're aspiring to. If you're traveling to another country and you see, you know, if you're a guy and you see some young woman that just rocks your world, how are you going to talk to her? Right. So out comes this little device that enables the two of you to talk to each other. Hmm. It's still a language translator. Who cares? There's right. nothing fancy about it. There are a billion of them on the market. But he had an approach to this that got everybody's attention, and he was written up all over the internet right. for it. Wow. So it is that sort of thing that is most compelling to me. And, and what that all comes back to is the messaging. What is the right. messaging about your product? How are you talking about it in a way that evokes or provokes an emotion in the consumer? And I don't care what the product is. There is always a way to talk about a product that will evoke or provoke an emotion right. in the consumer. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll just give you a real quick example. I had uh, a, a call the other day with a client who is has you know the latest, greatest, newest breathalyzer. And I said, well, are you planning to sell this to law enforcement? And they said, no, the consumers. And then they explained why they had come up with this product. And there are other products like this out there. And I said to them, and they were telling me all the, you know, the features of it. And I said, okay, why should I care? Right. And they couldn't tell me. And I said, now I'm going to tell you why your consumer is going to care and is going to, are, are going to buy this. And I said, you're going to target women because women are the chief consumers in the economy. Right. And women are more emotional than men. And if you pull the emotional strings in a woman, it's more likely that you can get her closer to buying. And so right. what you're doing in all of your marketing is playing on this idea of the woman who's out there for an evening with her BFF and that you always want to have that continue. You know, one of the beer companies or one of the, yeah, it must have been a beer company, they did an ad like this where there's the sad looking puppy who's alone at home, he's jumping right. on the sofa, looking out the window, and you know he's waiting for his mommy or daddy to get home, and it's getting later and later, and he's looking all forlorn, and then the guy walks in the door. And it's a, it, you know, it's a, um, uh, an anti-drunk driving type of campaign right. uh, sponsored by the people who are providing you with right. the alcohol, of course. But right. you know what? That, that wasn't at all about beating people over the head with fear and and saying to them it's something about their bad behavior if that's what they're engaging in. You're just using the emotional part of it to say, you you have this great life and you want more of it. Well, here's a way that you can do that. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's very powerful. So some of our listeners who uh, want to hear more about retail shock therapy, tell, give us a couple other highlights from your book. Sure. Um, the first thing you have to be thinking about is everywhere you show up on the internet, you have to treat as an advertisement. And I'm not, I'm not talking about paid advertisement. Whenever someone sees you anywhere on the internet, 
you are one click away from losing that person. So if somehow someone managed to get to your website or your Facebook page or a blog post that's been written about you or, or one that you have written, um, you have to consider that that person, once they arrive there, they're one click away from leaving. And if you don't give them a reason to stay there, everything you went to to get that person there has been wasted. Because what did you do? What did you give them once they got there? And because people's, people have such a short attention span, you have to grab them by the throat the second they arrive wherever, wherever it is that they're showing up. And so one of the examples is when people come to your website or they come to your Facebook page, the top of their computer screen or their mobile device is showing a big space that is often taken up with, here's the name of your company, here's the navigation items, you know, your, your main menu, and it's usually some picture of something. It right. might be a picture of the product, it might be, I don't know, a picture of hummingbirds or something. And when they arrive at the website, they have no idea what it is that you're doing. What are you saying to them? What have you done to tell them what you want to do when they arrive there, what kind of image have you presented to them that is provocative enough to get them to want to scroll down your website? Right. Because one thing people do is they're fretting so much about their website and what what am I, how do I write this page and what should I say and what do I need to include? And then here's all these extra pages right. that you can click through. You, you, they're never going there. You can look at your <laughs> Google Analytics and see where people are going to and just look at your bounce rate. Right. You can have the best you can have the best looking website and have a bounce rate of 97%. That people mm -hmm. get there and they have no idea what they're doing there and they leave because you didn't give them a reason to stay. Right. And so front and center, your top of your website, what is visible on a computer screen or a mobile device, that's your billboard. Right. The same thing with your Facebook cover photo. That is your billboard. And on that billboard, you need to show an image that is really compelling. It may not even have anything to do with your product, but you show this image that is really compelling, it's provocative, and you use a sentence, you use a caption, you use text on that image to give them an understanding of what you're doing there. So let's say it's an alarm company, and so you might use an image of someone inside in their bed sleeping and some dark shadowy silhouetted character outside the window so you instantly understand there's a level of fear here right and you know your text might say something like you know intruders not allowed or are you sleeping well through the night right or, how, how do you sleep at night and mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you're poking the bear you right. keep poking at the consumer you're poking them to provoke them to act. And so here you've got this scary picture, here you've said, how well do you sleep at night? And somewhere else it's there's a call to action button mm -hmm. that says, click here, click to feel safe at night. Right, feel peace of mind is a click away yeah. or a click, yeah, at, yeah exactly. that's, that's exactly. great. Yeah, and we so see so many times where often we, we tell clients it's unconscionable to have a big advertising campaign or whatever campaign you have, and then you, your goal was to get them to the site, yes. and then when they get there and they don't know what to do next, hold their hand, take them. Exactly. As consumers, our attention span is so short now, we expect mm -hmm. to be catered to when we get somewhere, and we expect for you to tell us that and, and to take right. us through the process. We want to be. We'll have shy clients who say, you know, we don't want to sell. No, they want to be. Yeah, there's a, there's the right way to do it, but they they are expecting that when they get there and so take them the rest of the way and hold their hand absolutely everything you just said is spot on and another thing that people are you know business owners are really reluctant to do companies are really reluctant to do this in fact I, I had a meeting with the Subaru Corporation and I was reviewing all of what you know they're doing in their digital marketing and so forth and they were doing a phenomenal job and this was with an agency that I was working with. And then I asked them why it was I never got an email from them. And they said, well, what do you mean? Because I had signed up for their email list when I knew I was going in for this meeting. And I signed up. I never got an acknowledgement email. 
I waited a week. I waited two weeks. In fact, I signed up on four different locations hmm. on their website, the Subaru corporate website, meaning where they're selling all their cars and everything. Four hmm. different places I signed up with my email. I never got a single email from them. And weeks later, I go into this meeting and I said, how come I never got an email from you? And they said, what are you talking about? I said, I signed up for in four places on your website to get email information from you. And they said, well, you know, we just do it periodically because we don't want to bother the consumer. Hmm. And I said to them, you have to be kidding. <laughs> and here's the example. Uh, there is an online lender called cabbage.com with a K. Okay. And I signed up because I had a client that was a, also an online lender trying to compete with Cabbage. Hmm. And I signed up for Cabbage's um, uh, email list. And I kid you not, in the span of 30 days, I got 32 emails from them. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, you would think, okay, well, you know, I'm going to just unsubscribe from the email list. I never did. And I still haven't because I don't want to take the time to do that. It's just easier for me to click delete. Right. But the reality is, is it doesn't cost you anything to do email marketing. And if social media were to disappear tomorrow, all you've got left is your email list. Right. And so for your listeners, if you are not aggressively building your email list, you're dead in the water mm -hmm. if anything happens on the internet or if something happens with the economy because your best customer is one that you've already sold to. Right. You don't have to work at selling to people who've already bought from you. You have to work at getting that first sale from them. And the way we get that first sale with a lot of goods or, or goods and services or products and services is that we have to take the time to develop a relationship with them. And how do we do that? We do that through our email campaigns. Hmm. And where people go down the path and fall off a cliff is they're constantly selling in their email marketing. You don't mm -hmm. do that. You just keep talking to people. Right. You provide them with helpful information. You ask their opinion about things and you don't sell. Because if they are opening your emails and they find the information useful and helpful, at the point that you do send them, maybe it's a discount or a special that you're running, they are primed and ready to buy from you if they're likely to buy. Right. And also, much like with Cabbage, the online lender, who am I going to think about if I ever need a small business loan? I don't even care who else is out there. Right. All I know is I've been hearing from Cabbage every single day of my life. And they've and made an effort to stay, they've made an effort mm -hmm. to keep in touch with you. Right. And it costs them nothing. Right. So that that that's the thing. It, it really is using the, you know just two takeaways that are I, that I cover in the book. Mm. Uh, and things that people could implement this very instant after they're done listening is to make sure that everywhere you are on the internet, especially your website and your social media presence, wherever someone might land, this includes, you know, what are you using for your YouTube channel? You know, how are you looking out there um, on Instagram and other places that you're posting things and so forth? Everything is a giant billboard for you and you have right. to treat it as such and that's the kind of thing that you put out there. And, you know, one thing that companies do is they, oh, my God, they will often hire interns to do all of their social media <laughs> marketing. Yes. They don't want to pay people, and they, think, and they think that they're being successful because they've got somebody, or even if they have an entire team of people who do this stuff within the company. They think, oh, as long as I'm getting stuff out there, as long as I've, you know, got stuff going out on Facebook, then I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Because most people who are in management positions in companies are not digital marketing people. They, they, they are not expert at using the internet for the purpose of marketing. And so they hear all this stuff, they read all this stuff, they maybe buy these programs or these training programs that teach them how to do certain things, but they have no understanding of what they're doing and why. And it's this whole idea of everything that you're putting out there is, is causing people to feel like at some point they're going to buy from you. You just have to make sure you are in their face in a way that is so compelling that what you're posting out there on social media has value to people and that you're not always selling. You have to be really mindful about every message that goes out to the consumer hmm. because if you're careless about it, you're, that prospect is walking away because they can smell that crap a mile away. Right. They can smell that you're disingenuous, that you have some intern posting crap that they don't care about that's right. junking up their feed on Facebook. And, you know, you will never get that sale. Hmm. 
That's such great advice. I, I can't wait to read the book. I've got it ordered out. I just ordered on Amazon. Oh, and so- I, I want to recommend that our listeners go on Amazon, look up Retail Shock Therapy, prescription for what ails your online sales. Again, that's that's uh, Damon John from Shark Tank calls it a must read for businesses selling online, which should be all of us <laughs> in one way or another, after, especially after today. Yeah, uh, no a couple, kidding. couple more quick questions in just another minute. Just t- tell me what's next for you. You've got so much going on. Is there anything big that you have yet to do yet that's on your, your bucket list um, that's coming up for you or that you want to clear some time to work on? Uh, well, actually, um, you know, I wrote Retail Shock Therapy uh, on the advice of someone that I uh, uh, had been talking to about some ideas that I had. I had three things that I wanted to write about uh, because of the kind of experience that I've had in in different areas. I felt that I, I wanted to write these books because I, I didn't even care if people ever paid for the books. I just wanted to get the information out there because of all the things that I've learned, um, there are things that are common to every company and every person that is in a given situation. And so on the advice of this person, she recommended that I, I release retail shock therapy first. But in fact, my real passion is my book. I didn't lose my job. They took it hmm. because I know what it felt like to have my job taken away. And I had a big paycheck. I had I owned three houses at the time. I had all kinds of money in the bank. Uh, I had retirement money. I, I was I won't, I won't say I was living large. I certainly wasn't living large. It was more a matter of, you know, by the time I was getting into my late 40s, I pretty well thought I had everything dialed in for mm. the rest of my life. And, you know, when I turned 48, that's when they took my job. And that's not where you want to be because ultimately the houses went away. Everything went away. Right. Because what are you going to do when you're unemployed? And you know, yeah. the biggest insult to me, you know, having had that big paycheck is the first time I got my unemployment check and it was one tenth of what I was taking home. Wow. And, you know, you're carrying mortgages and you've got all these expenses and you're plowing through all of your life savings just to keep afloat. And there was no help for anyone at that time. People who were in my situation, there was no help. There were for, there was help for people who had gotten into mortgages. They had never, they never had any business being in. Right. And there was help for all kinds of other people. But there was this whole raft of people in the country, high level management people. There was no help. And so I, I watched all of my savings disappear, all at the same time that I was getting this business up and running. And I figured, well, if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down in flames. Hmm. And I'm going to have one hell of a time on the way. And so for me, the thing that I feel uh, most emotionally committed to is the completion of this book, which I should have done within the next month or two, because right. I feel that when a person has their job taken away, what happens to them emotionally because of how tied we are to the employers that provide us with our income. It just is devastating. And the last half of the book, I talk about all the ways you get yourself back into the, Hmm. all of the ways that you reenter the market in a way you are in control of things and that you're never in that situation again. That's exciting. I look forward to reading that one as well. Arlene, <laughs> thank you so much for being our guest oh, today. My pleasure. Thank uh, you, you so you much. You are, uh, you're an, again, an inspiration, a great example. You're an innovator. You are a great entrepreneur. You're very successful. You've created an international brand. Congratulations. Yep. Uh, you, and, and coming out of, of having a job loss, which you're writing about right now, to what you've done today is, is truly incredible. And it's just a great example of the, the American dream and the, and the innovative entrepreneurial spirit. And yeah. uh, it's exciting to see. So we look forward to continuing to following you and seeing the great things that you do next uh, and to reading your books. So thank you again. And we wish you the best. Well, thanks so much, Derek. I really appreciate it and wish best of luck to all of your listeners. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Take a five-minute complimentary marketing assessment for your business. Whether you're a startup or an established brand looking for more quality customers for your business, This confidential assessment will help you identify the next logical steps for appropriate marketing tools, strategy, and development for making sure your branding and marketing campaign is a success. 
Visit AssessMyMarketing.com today. That's AssessMyMarketing.com.